Welcome back. It's a new bright day for me. Uh, and uh, hopefully I uh, sorted out some of the technical issues I was having with uh, the last bit with the screen going wonky. Apparently there's um, a known problem when you're using uh, the Mac PDF viewer in full screen mode across multiple displays that it sometimes does wonky uh, wonky things so I won't have that issue. Um, we're gonna have just two real brief parts on uh, uh, viscoelasticity at least that uh, linear viscoelasticity. So I mentioned before that for rubber elasticity, right, for to have a, a elastic polymer a, that, that can undergo large deformations, you need a significant degree of cross-linking. On the other hand, when you don't have that and you have a relatively lower molecular weight, your behavior depends on a couple different things, right? So in the reading and in your previous work, and I, I now thinking about it, I should have emphasized it a little bit in the lecture, the definition of an elastic deformation is that the load is, um, the deformation is essentially instantaneous with the applied load, so there's no time dependency, and it's fully recoverable, and it recovers as soon as you remove the load. So there's no time dependence uh, or path dependence to a purely elastic loading. Polymers with low molecular weights will often have a very uh, strong time dependence to their loading. And so we can break up uh, the behavior into two parts. First, the elastic solid, right? That's a def definite shape which deforms by external loads and reverts instantaneously to the original shape when the loads are removed. And a and they also behave partially like a viscous liquid, right? No definite shape and flows irreversibly under the action of external forces. So polymers can be anywhere in between, depending on the molecular weight, the temperature, solvents, right? Now, of course, the big example is silly putty, right? If you just set a ball of silly putty out, it flows over a period of hours, right? Under the purely gravitational forces, it will flow like a liquid. Um, if you hit it with a hammer, it fractures like glass. And if you bounce it on the ground, it bounces like a, uh, a rubber ball. Polymer melts too. If you've ever um, seen polymer injection molding or polymer extrusion, uh, they either act like liquids, like rubber, or they can have what's called melt fracture, where if the shear rates are too high during the extrusion process, the, uh, the liquid coming, not really the liquid, the polymer melt coming out of the uh, extruder can fracture. And so this whole range of response is termed elastic, viscoelasticity, visco viscoplasticity. We're going to focus on on viscoelasticity, which implies that uh, some, if not most, of the deformation is uh, recoverable, but it's a time-dependent response. So visco, right, has to do with, uh, so viscosity. So what is viscosity? So if we make an analogous relationship to Hooke's law, Right, rather than sigma stress is equal to stiffness times strain, uh, 
here we have the stress is proportional to the strain rate. And that uh, proportionality constant is what we're going is what is known as the viscosity. Now for a viscoplastic model, this would be the plastic strain rate. We'll talk about that when we get to plasticity. Um, for viscoelasticity, this is an elastic strain or a total strain. So for viscoelastic materials, we have a superposition of these stresses. Right? We have a part that depends just on the total elastic strain and a part that depends on the instantaneous strain rate. Um, Hooke's law is valid at small strains. Newton's law becomes valid for low for low strain rates. Um, to make it more a little more realistic, this viscosity term can depend on a lot of factors. It can depend on temperature, right? It could also depend on the instantaneous uh, strain rate. For you know, example, um, where that's the case is in metallic glasses, where at low uh, strain rates, now it's a little more complicated than that because there's other things that go into it. But I don't want to get too sidetracked. But the viscosity itself can depend on the strain rate. Um, and that leads to nonlinear viscoelasticity. But here we're going to just think of viscosity as a constant for a given temperature. And uh, we'll have uh, linear viscoelasticity. Okay, so we can break this viscoelastic behavior down into two limiting cases. One is creep and another is um, stress relaxation. So creep is the time-dependent change in strain at a constant stress. When we get to stress relaxation, we're going to hold the strain constant and look at how the, the stress changes with time. So in contrast to metals, to, to, to metals the creep in polymers is often recoverable. So when we, we're going to go through a loading schedule like this, no load, we're going to add a stress hold that stress constant, release it, hold it at zero stress for a while, and then add a load in that's twice as big as the original. Hold it, release. So what happens to the strain? Nothing, nothing, nothing. We apply the stress. We get a instantaneous strain. That's our elastic response. And then we get a time-dependent creep where the load slowly increases with time and the rate of that extension decays with time. So eventually, if we just hold this asymptotically, right, it will eventually reach a, a stable strain. But we're not, in this case, we're not holding it out that long. In reality, it would probably fracture before it gets to the stable strain, but that's creep rupture. We'll talk about it in a different, different lecture. But we hold it at a constant stress. Then when we remove the stress, we recover this initial elastic part instantaneously. And then when we hold it at zero strain, zero stress, this part here, will slowly relax back. And after we hold it for a long time, there may or may not be some irrecoverable strain. And that's uh, plastic deformation due to the Newtonian flow of this material. Now, since it's a linear viscoelastic material, if we add twice the stress, we get twice the initial elastic response. Our creep rate is exactly twice as fast, so that our total strain at the end of the creep regime is twice as high. We recover our elasticity and relax, and we end up with twice 
the irrecoverable deformation. Right? If it's a linear viscoelastic material, I can simply take this curve and scale it for any uh, stress value. Right? And so that allows us to define a, a creep compliance, right? So it's linear it's a linear behavior if the magnitudes of E1, E2, and E3 are all proportional to the magnitude of the applied stress. And so what this uh, uh, creep compliance is, it's the, it's the strain as a function of time divided by the stress. So this creep compliance is a time-dependent uh, time to function time dependent function um, so and we can consider it as the uh, superposition of these different loading regimes it also make a little more sense in a bit I promise so linear amorphous polymers, so that ones that are not cross-linked or branched, low density polyethylene, um, can show significant creep compliance, uh, right? Significant uh, Newtonian flow, right? So that means J3 here tells you the amount of strain due to uh, Newtonian flow. Right above their glass transition temperatures, they may creep until creep rupture occurs. At lower temperatures, the J1, the initial elastic response, and J2, the time-dependent creep response, time-dependent but recoverable creep response is going to dominate. In semi-crystalline and highly cross-linked polymers, J3 tends to be uh, quite small, and you're not going to see... Um, permanent Newtonian flow in these in these materials. But however you still can, right? If you think about the the archetypical elastomer, vulcanized rubber, right? Old bias ply tires, if you you know let your car sit for a couple months, your tires would develop flat spots. All right, and that's just the Newtonian flow, a long, long term Newtonian flow. And if you drove your tires, if you rode on those tires for a while, eventually they would become uh, round again uh, due to the, the long term flow of the pressure uh, pushing back and the forces that the tire experiences during driving. So time dependence of the uh, creep compliance. So we have this tau we're going to define as a characteristic time scale for creep. And so it, at short loading times, the material behaves as glassy or an ideal elastic material. This is the silly putty bouncing like a ball. Right? The load is given as a short impulse. Right? There isn't time for flow to happen. In intermediate times, you're in this viscoelastic regime. At long loading times, you're, the material behaves as what's called rubbery or leathery. I think silly putty, right? Where you get considerable plastic flow. At even longer times, you don't really have an elastic. Uh, longer loads, loading times, you don't really have an elastic response. You just have a, a flow. So extended time scale experiments usually will make use of a time temperature superposition or force temperature superposition. And basically that short experience experiments at higher temperatures. So at higher temperatures, the, this curve keeps the same shape, but the time scale is pushed this way on the log time axis. So you can do short term experiments at lower forces and higher temperatures, or you can do long-term experiments at 
lower temperatures and longer times and higher forces. Stress relaxation is the, the opposite. Here we're going to hold a constant strain and we'll look at the stress that is required to maintain that deformation and we'll see that it's going to decay with time. Um, for amorphous linear low molecular weight branched polymers this stress may decay to actually zero and then you'll you would have a, a permanent uh, it would be permanent deformation completely at that point. So here we hold we're keeping a constant strain and we look at how our stress decays with time and we define a relaxation modulus that is completely analogous uh, to the um, creep modulus. Okay. An important concept to help analyze the viscoelastic response for or the linear viscoelastic response is this idea of the Boltzmann superposition principle. Right. And Boltzmann proposed way back in 1876 that the, the creep is a function of the entire loading history of your sample. Um, right, each loading step makes an independent contribution, uh, but you need to consider all those contributions uh, independently. And there's some equations here, and they might not make a lot of sense until we look at it um, kind of conceptually. Okay, so what we're what we're doing here is a two-step loading. So we're going to load, hold at constant stress, bump the stress up, and hold. So first we no stress, we load, we get an initial elastic response, and we begin to, to creep over some period of time. Now we can imagine this load acting in isolation, so eventually it would just continue on and on forever. We add a second load, right? It makes sense. We get an initial elastic jump and we continue to creep. But we can analyze what happens at the second in terms of adding a, another independent load. So we can just pretend that this is the zero that this is now the zero stress state. Add the same load, we get the same elastic response, and then creep. And overall, it's just the superposition of this loading event plus this loading event gives us the, the total. All right? We can think about creep and recovery. Now, we add a stress, we hold it, we release the stress. We add the stress, we get the el elastic response. We add a, um, we have our creep. Now we're going to relax but instead of thinking about it as removing the stress, think about it as adding a negative stress. So if we add a second stress, right, we would get the elastic response and the creep, but think about it as adding a negative. Right? Take our original curve, add the negative of this response. So here we get the initial unla elastic unloading and the uh, the negative of this creep. Now because this happened sooner, this creep rate or this relaxation rate, we'll call it here, is faster than this. But since this asymptotically tends to a stable value and this will asymptotically tend to a stable value, in the long time this curve plus the negative of this curve will tend asymptotically to zero. All right, And that is uh, basically the Boltzmann superposition.
right? And this just says that I can add my individual uh, loading event. My total strain is given by the individual loading events, right? And usually we write it as an integral rather than as a sum over a huge, huge bunches of, of uh, time. And we say the elastic strains are instantaneous, so we can define what is known as a, a this unrelaxed modulus. And uh, this stress as a function of time gives us the stress at the total end of our experiment. So this is kind of like an instantaneous, and this is a deviation from that. This is an average response, and this is a considered like a deviation from that average response. And we have completely analogous equations for equations. So I'm going to stop there, and then we'll have a really, really short uh, lecture on some elementary micromechanical models that have been used over the years to describe uh, viscoelasticity.